Okay, welcome everybody to rut hunting strategies. Uh, so tonight we're right before rut, so that's why we kind of planned this uh, for this time of year, which should be starting up here. At least we'll be going over what this actually is. It's not quite rut, it's pre-rut as we're getting into this, these next coming weeks here. Um, but before we get started on what rut is and how to hunt it, let's do some quick reminders. So just so you guys know, your microphones and webcams are turned off, um, but you guys can con contact us through um, the Q&A window or through chat. You can talk to each other through that as well. So any questions you guys might have, uh, we don't cover everything in this PowerPoint, but if you have any questions or anything, just put it in the chat or question Q&A box there and we will answer them. Um, sometimes it makes it much more fun if we have some questions that go off on tangents on. Um, and trust me, we love some tangents. Uh, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let us know if you have any questions. And then um, you will get a copy of this PowerPoint for your reference. Um, we'll email you out a copy of this PowerPoint. And then we'll give you any handouts that we may mention and a link to a YouTube recording of this power of this webinar and uh, a feedback survey. Please fill that out and get back to us. That way we can grow as a program and understand uh, if we covered all the bases or if you left anything out there, um, let us know kind of what our audience is as well. So it just helps us kind of figure out our program and, and what, what to make it better with. So appreciate that. And again, at the end of the webinar, we will sit back here and answer any questions you may have about hunting in general. So uh, if you have any questions about the PowerPoint or anything else, we'll be here and uh, let us know. So the presenters tonight, we will have Dan Stevens. Dan, you want to say hi? Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. It should be a, a fun, filled evening. Uh, you should learn learn something, even if you're a, an experienced hunter and you've been around the, the block a time or two. I, I promise you'll probably take at least a, a tip or two away, but it uh, should be a, a really fun night. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, I really enjoy these more, uh, not the one, I mean, one-on-ones and one-on-twos are good, but these like this webinar, as well as the stand placement one, I really feel like has practical, you can actually use this next week type of thing. Yeah, and, and we kind of designed this PowerPoint to, to really just kind of direct the conversation more than anything and just have some visualization. So we certainly want it to be, con you know, conversational. So like Jason said, uh, please use the Q&A feature, the chat, and I uh, would love to, to hear from you and, and chat to you throughout. All right. And we also have with us is uh, Curtis Twelman. Curtis, you want to say hi quick? Hello, everybody. How you doing, Curtis? Um, and then I'm Jason Buckley. So welcome. And with that, uh, a little bit of a course outline here. We're going to talk some bed, the bed feed pattern and then going over the different phases of rut and uh, how the different strategies kind of work in with those phases. So uh, really straightforward and practical info, like I said. So uh, getting us started, we're going to have Dan talk about some mistakes people commonly make. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to, to touch on a, a few things. And, and most of, of these kind of common mistakes will be, you know, points that we hit on throughout the, this webinar. And, you know, especially when we get to the more strategic portion, the, the latter half of, of tonight's webinar, it really focuses on some strategic and, and techniques that we can utilize in in these next few weeks that are that are so critical to, to you know deer success and, and you know success of field but some of these these big common mistakes i see and i hear from a lot of folks especially i personally myself only hunt public land as well as jason and curtis um so we're out there with a lot of other hunters and one thing that, that i think we all experience on a, a pretty regular basis and i think everybody in this chat if you've been out you know deer hunting quite a bit on public land probably runs into it as well and it's this concept of overcalling. And calling can be a, a very influential strategy to your hunt planning or to your, you know, your strategic approach. But there's, there's kind of two schools of thought. And I'll, I'll kind of give my thoughts here. And, and if Curtis or Jason has, has kind of the you know, opposing view, they can certainly give their input as well. But there's kind of these two schools of thought. There's blind calling and then there's this targeted calling. And, and when I'm using the term blind calling, it's something that I personally don't do very often. It's essentially just calling into the void that is the – the habitat or the forest that you're you're hunting and hoping that something hears that and is then receptive to it. Um, I like a more targeted approach, especially these next few weeks. I personally do not call to deer unless I can visually see that deer. Um, deer are by nature fairly fairly vocal species, especially in terms of mammals. A lot of people think mammals are are fairly quiet, you know, compared to birds and, and some other you know animal groups. But um, by and large, they're they're very vocal. But the way they react to vocalizations is, is really important. And that's what we're going to touch on quite a bit tonight in a few of the strategies. But I kind of wanted to, to set the stage there. 
another common mistake that, that a lot of hunters make during rut. And again, you know, especially this one, we all have these personal constraints like time and, you know, availability. We all have work and family commitments, um, but only hunting dawn and dusk. Um, midday can be extremely productive during these these next few weeks, um, a lot more so than, than really any other part of the year. And so if you have the ability to hunt through that midday, uh, it can be extremely productive. I know, you know, me personally, about 70 or six out of eight of the quote unquote wall hangers, um, the, the mature bucks that I've harvested have all been from about 11 a.m. to about 2 p.m. So in those midday hours where a lot of people are already back at the truck eating lunch, there seems to be, especially during rut, you see this this little uptick in activity during you know the the the, the middle of the day, and there there's kind of a, a few different kind of thesis of, of why that occurs. But one of the the big ones is especially these mature bucks, they start to become a little bit educated, especially these older bucks. You know the old saying, they don't get old by being dumb, and that that really is the case. And so they will adjust their movements to you know reduce conflict, reduce running into hunters. And a lot of times you can have a, a very good hunt in the middle of the day. Also being too passive uh, and kind of on the flip side, being too aggressive too. We'll go over that a lot um, during this, this webinar, but hunting the same stand sit after sit, um, even if you're not seeing activity. If you are you know, very convinced that that's a productive stand, that can sure be a, a strategy that's worth trying and just continue to sit that stand over and over. But there's a lot of land out there. There's a lot of other opportunities. So don't get essentially pigeonholed. I know, you know, we all have, family who hunt the same tree or the exact same spot year after year after year regardless if they see anything that's just their their hunting spot during rut um, i encourage you to to branch out a little bit if you're not seeing activity try somewhere else um, kind of the, along the same lines hunting where you saw a buck weeks ago especially during rut patterns change drastically and they can change on on it on a dime um, especially as we move towards kind of peak rut um, they become, especially bucks, they become a little less patternable. They don't have the, the same patterns because obviously at this time they're out chasing does rather than their kind of standard bed to feed pattern. And so we need to have some updated information on, on these areas uh, before we, we go hunt them. Another big one is ducking the weather. Uh, weather, especially inclement weather or changing weather patterns can be very productive during rut. It really does ramp up activity and especially daylight activity. So I really like to watch out for those, those weather fronts and either hunt on the front side of it or the back side. Or if we get some misty days or some really windy days during rut, I will still be out there, but I will be using the terrain a little bit and try to find bottoms or other areas that are kind of on the leeward side of slopes that are protected from that kind of prominent wind direction. Well, again, we'll talk it, and go through some examples of, of, e of each of these. Another big one is ignoring does, right? Obviously during rut, a lot of people are focused on getting that, that buck or filling an, an antlered tag or buck tag, but where are the bucks gonna be? They're gonna be by the does. So don't forget about the does this time of year. They're arguably just as important at, if you're a buck hunter as, as the buck you're looking for. So pay attention to those, to those does. Another common mistake, I have personally been guilty of this when I first started bow hunting um, about 15 years ago. I always forgot, oh, finally I have a doe in range. And then I shoot her and then 15 yards later, there's a, a buck that was kind of cruising behind her. And so that's a, a behavior you're gonna see a lot during the next few weeks is this chasing or just a pursuit of these does. Once a, a buck identifies a doe is in estrus and is receptive to breed, He's going to start chasing her. He's going to start tailing her. He's going to start harassing her. And so if you are really focused on getting that buck tag, just be cognizant of the doe's body language. If, if does come in and they're constantly looking over their shoulder, they're constantly sticking their nose up, trying to turn around, their ears are kind of always flipping back and they just look a little on edge, chances are there might be a buck pursuing them. Um, he may be, you know, a few seconds behind, he may be a few minutes behind, he may be an hour behind, or he may have lost interest at some point, but still utilizing that body language can, can really tell you whether those does are being harassed or not. And if, if that's in your kind of planning process, if you want to shoot a doe, go right ahead. If you want to hold out for a buck and those does are looking a little antsy, you may want to pass on those, let them walk by and see if they have that, you know, that trailer following right behind them. But now we're gonna kind of start to, to get into, for, for a lot of people, this will be a, a fairly in-depth review um, for, for lack of a better term, but I want to go through the ecology of rut, the behavior of rut, because rut can, 
essentially be broken down into very segmented phases and understanding the 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 ecological the habitat use and essentially the behavior differences between each of these rut segments can really aid not only in where you're hunting but also your strategic approach and so we're just going to take kind of a a real slow walk through what the progression of rut looks like what bucks are doing what does are doing what we expect them to be doing where we expect them to be and that can really aid our, our hunt planning process and really I think paint a good picture when we get towards the, the strategy portion at the, at the latter portion of this, this webinar. Uh, so just kind of bear with us as we go through this, this kind of, you know, deep dive into rut ecology and rut behavior, but much of deer hunting, especially outside of rut can be boiled down to, to one single concept. And that's this bed to feed pattern. We've got a, a quick illustration to, to kind of highlight that. And so this is, again, if you've sat through our, our webinars for some time, you're probably familiar with this map. It, it's one of my favorites. I show it a lot, but this is a piece of public land in Illinois. And what I really want to highlight here is how the terrain can be utilized to essentially predict how animals are going to traverse and move across the landscape. Um, deer and really just wildlife in general, like us, are kind of lazy by nature. We like to take the paths of, of least resistance. I've, I've heard Curtis Twellman uh, say it kind of best, and he was kind of describing it the other day, and he said, you know, even as we're just kind of walking around outside as humans, our, our brain is always calculating the path of least resistance. We're not, you know, consciously doing it. It's just always occurring. And that, that same kind of principle is applying to, to wildlife here. And so we can use the terrain to, to kind of predict where we expect those wildlife to move just by using that kind of hypothesis that wildlife like to take the path of least resistance unless they're you know pressured by a predator or a human or, or something to that extent but so we can see here on this map we essentially have a, a nice oxbow or kind of a, a bend in the river that kind of creates this northern barrier it's a fairly steep slope on the, the side of that bank so deer don't like to go up and down it they certainly will if again they need to or they're pressured to but ideally they don't like to make that and same on the, the southern side of this X, we can see we have these brown kind of snaking lines that are kind of moving across the, the map. Those are what we refer to as contour lines, and those are essentially topographic lines that show different layers of elevation. And the closer those lines are together, the steeper the slope is. The further apart they are, the gentler the slope is essentially. And so on, in this example, we have a fairly steep slope on the south portion of that X, and we have this oxbow that's creating another kind of funnel point on the north. And so we essentially have these two areas of, of kind of, for lack of a better term, impassable areas. So deer just naturally funnel right between that slope on the southern side of that X and the creek right there on the north. So that's kind of the, 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 the simple pattern that a lot of deer hunters follow. During rut, that can still be a completely viable strategy. But tonight we're gonna to talk about a few other things you can do to enhance that strategy and also some other techniques that, that you can kind of work in. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the ecology of rut and feel free to again, to jump in Curtis and Jason here if you have any thoughts, but rut is essentially the mating season of cervids or of deer. Um, it typically lasts about three weeks um, with varying stages. And again, we kind of talked about those differing behaviors and how that can really influence us as hunters and what we're going to do. The, the big benefit of rut and why so many deer hunters focus on rut is because it leads to increased deer activity across the board. Deer, especially bucks, start to let go almost a little bit of their inhibition. They're a little bit more careless. They're not as cautious. They're hormone driven and basically focused on one thing and that's breeding. And we as hunters can kind of utilize that to our advantage and kind of use some of that behavior against, against them. I do want to kind of start off by talking about what, yeah. <laughs> I like that Curtis, like Mardi Gras for deer, exactly. But I, I do want to touch on, before we get into the stages of rut, what is causing rut? There's a, a lot of theories out there that talk about lunar phases and temperature, and while all those things can impact deer movement, they do not trigger or, or kind of signal the, the start of rut. What actually signals and, and starts rut is a term we call photo period. And essentially that's the amount of daylight 
that is in an individual day. And obviously these are fairly consistent year over year. And that's why peak rut and a lot of these different, you know, segments of rut all fall within the same time frame year over year over year is because again, it's not those lunar phases. It's not the temperature. It's that photo period. Again, those things can still impact deer movement, but they're not triggering rut. So just kind of want to clarify that uh, right off the, the start. But we'll first start off with a, a quick conversation about pre-rut because I would argue pre-rut is, I think, the ideal time for hunters to be out there. That's when you're going to see the most activity, um, especially the most daylight activities. You get later and later into rut. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I, I want to hunt peak rut. Personally, I will try to avoid hunting peak rut. I want to hunt that lead up to, to, to peak rut and then the tail end right after that, that peak rut. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, but first, we'll start off with a quick discussion about this seeking phase. So we'll, we'll first start off, I guess, in the, the summer, just to, again, really set the stage here. But pre-rut essentially does start in the summer, if you look at, at kind of the ecology of deer. Deer have antlers, they don't have horns, so those are shed annually. And that is what really starts to develop and, and trigger the hormone, the testosterone in the males to start developing. Now it is nowhere near its peak levels at, at this point, but that testosterone is starting starting to, to increase and starting to, to take over. Um, but we really don't start to see that testosterone start peaking until early November. Um, but you'll, you'll start to see that, again, that testosterone is what triggers this antler development, the antler growth. But what's really cool about this time of year is we see some really distinct behavior out of bucks. During the summer, we have what we call bachelor groups where all the bucks are really grouping up. They're not solitary. They're spending times with other males, which is unusual, right? Obviously, in the fall and winter, that's when they start to, to kind of have this divergence away from each other and start honing in on their own home range that they're going to, to kind of mark as their territory for the breeding season. And again, what really signifies that bachelor group breakup is that testosterone level starting to increase in the bucks and starting to, to get them ready for the, the breeding season. Now, one thing you'll, you'll really start to see towards, you know, mid October, and these are literally all over the, the landscape right now is scrapes and rubs. I will give a little bit of caution uh, before we kind of move too much further along in scrapes and just say that scrapes can be one of those things that I, I know I'm guilty of it. I know I've talked to Jason. I've heard him tell stories. He, he's guilty of it too as well, that when you find a scrape, you're like, oh, I, I found it. I'm here. He's going to be here. And you may sit that scrape for six or seven days and you may never see that deer, even though you go to it and you can tell that he's maintaining it every single day it's it's fresh he's scraping all the leaves off the ground he's urinating in it but he's just not there and a lot of that is because the vast majority of time that bucks are visiting these scrapes is during about 2 a.m to about 4 or 5 a.m there's been a few different studies that looked on that one of the one of the big ones out of the georgia uh, deer lab looked at it but a lot of that scrape visitation is during those nighttime hours so outside of legal shooting light so while scrapes are very productive especially knowing in the back of your head what scrapes are used for they can be very productive but i don't recommend staking your entire rut hunt sitting over a scrape um, rubs are kind of along the, the same line um, what's really i think frustrating and challenging about rut or about rubs is you may find a rub on a tree that you know is, is 10 inches in diameter and it may be the only rub that you find i personally if I find a single rub, a lot of times I just kind of, I don't throw that information out, but I'm not going to sit on it. I'm not going to hunt on it. What I'm really looking for is rub lines and finding a line of rubs. Because what that shows me is it shows me we are essentially inside of that buck's home core range. And once you're essentially in his quote unquote bedroom, you have a really high likelihood of, of having an encounter with him and trying to get him with an arrow. So scrapes are, are very good, good to find. Um, one of my favorite strategies we'll get into a, a little bit later is using doe estrus inside of a scrape um, can be can be quite productive. But just a, a quick caution there before we get too far. Yeah, and then just to add on to scrapes and the benefits of finding them would be uh, trail cam setups. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you don't want to. It's really hard to get addicted to trail cam cam photos and also then to sit there. Um, yes. So <laughs> please don't fall into that 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 trap but it is a nice way to see what kind of bucks are in the area some bucks visiting there may only be there that night but other times you might see one 
relatively frequently. And uh, like I'm talking like every third day or so. And then yeah, yeah. In the area. So then use that information to kind of help hone in where to go next, not really to hunt that spot. And then use also look around for other sign, like Dan has said, rub lines are a much more, uh, a, a, a higher priority sign than is just a random rub or a scrape. The rub lines are really key. So something yeah. to think about. And if you go on to the next slide, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why rubs are made. Because again, I, I know it, oftentimes this ecology and, and behavior stuff can seem boring, but I promise if you start to put these pieces together about why a deer is, is making a rub on a tree, why he's making a scrape on the ground, and then you figure out why is he scraping there as opposed to 200 yards that way, why he choose here. And once you start putting these pieces together, it really does paint a picture of what that buck's core home range is and what he's doing. So I do want to talk a little bit about the biology of rubs. Um, and essentially, there's a lot of a lot of different theories out there about rubs. There's, you know, I've, I've heard that, that people like or that deer will use them to strengthen their neck and, and kind of practice fighting. And again, there may be some truth to that. But by and large, the, the purpose of, of rubs and scrapes, for, for lack of a better term, are communication. They essentially use, excuse me, use these as communication tools between other bucks and other does. And the way a, a buck is going to communicate by using a rub is on the base of his antler. So the antler would sit right on his head, right at the base of that antler will be a scent gland. And that scent gland is going to just disperse some basic pheromones that identify himself, you know, as, as himself. And essentially he's, in addition to, you know, scraping the bark off that tree, he's depositing that scent directly on on that that tree and so it acts as this communication tool he's marking his boundaries and his territory and he will come back and check these quite regularly again it might be during nighttime hours not during daylight activity but if i find a rub line like you can see here in this kind of illustration at the bottom like we talked about if i find, like i mentioned if i find a single rub that's great i kind of highlight it but i don't really use it a lot in my strategy but if i find a rub line that's when I start to, to really get excited. Because again, that shows you that you're inside of his core range. He's marking that territory often. And chances are he's visiting these rubs quite frequently. Hey, Dan, in the question yeah. we have, uh, do bucks scrape and rub all year round or just during rut? Great question. So there will occasionally be some outside of, of rut um, scrapes and rubs, but 99% of, of that behavior and of that sign is going to be made from really October 15th-ish to about the end of November is when you're going to see a lot of that made. And he, really even mid-November is when it'll kind of slow down. They'll, they'll keep freshening up, uh, but they won't make too many more. But that's a really good question. A lot of it, you'll, you'll really start to see scrapes and rubs start to appear everywhere about the third week in October, you'll start to, to find some sporadic ones in the first and second week in October. And so they really start ramping up pretty much right now. They're, they're pretty much in, in full force. Yeah, and as you're out, if you ever make it out uh, scouting off season, like in the summertime, you'll, you'll find old rubs that are old mm -hmm. scars yep. and old and things. And you tell and oftentimes I, I still even keep track of those. I still record those because unless that buck was harvested, and even if he was, chances are there's probably going to be another buck that's going to instantly fill that territory in that home range. And you may find him interacting with those old rubs again. Yeah, I mean, it's all key to help you figure out where bedding area is at, because that's the that's the real home run, is, is knowing where they're bedding at and being able to hunt that properly. Is, yeah, uh, yeah. And we've got some really good examples of that. Yep. But moving on to, to scrapes, again, another communication tool. And the way uh, that, that uh, especially a buck, because bucks and does will both utilize these scrapes. And you can actually see, this is a, a decent sized scrape I found on a piece of public land in central Illinois. Um, you can actually see the the claw marks from those deer's hoof as he's in there raking these leaves away and and you know basically just clearing this this bare spot that in some cases is as big as a car hood. Um, they can be quite large, but the way a, a buck in particular is going to utilize a scrape is first of all he wants to locate that scrape where he expects does to be. And again, this is where I, I kind of get back to that concept of putting all these pieces together of, of why, where, and how. He is choosing a location for a scrape where he expects does are going to either traverse near that scrape 
or walk through it. Because what he's going to do, every within probably every 24 to 48 hours, he's going to visit that scrape. He's going to freshen it up, remove all that vegetation. He's going to urinate in it. And when he urinates in it, he's going to essentially close his back legs together. And inside of his knee joint, he has two tarsal glands. So that urine runs down the inside of his legs, picks up pheromones from those two tarsal glands, and then deposits it on the ground. And so now he's essentially marking the ground with his urine and pheromones from these tarsal glands. And his whole reason for doing this, he will do it in mid-October as a communication tool and as a territorial thing. But what he's really focused on right now and over the, the next few weeks, he's marking it with his sign. And now he's hoping a doe is going to come by, smell it. She's going to be receptive to breed. Then she's going to mark the same scrape. And that's why he needs to keep coming back and checking these scrapes night after night to see if a doe has visited it, if she's in heat. And then at that point, he will begin chasing her and trying to, you know, tail her across. He looks like a little high schooler out there chasing, you know, his first girlfriend, but he'll just run her across the country. And so now we have an understanding of he wants does to walk by it. So he's going to want it to be in a very commonly utilized doe travel corridor a doe, a, on a, a feeding area near a doe bedding area. And so once you start to put some of these pieces together, you can see the value of identifying a scrape. Um, again, a lot of that activity of the buck coming up and freshening up the scrape and, and you know depositing his scent there is happening after dark but that still lets you know you're in that zone and all it takes is one hot doe to be in the area to hit that scrape and then the chase is on now i do want to talk about this concept of primary scrapes a little bit um again primary scrapes are just these really big ones that that kind of i just illustrated you know the size of a, a car hood and one thing you'll always 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 see over a scrape is a low hanging branch that's about a buck's height off of the ground. And you can see a, a pretty good illustration of that here. And essentially what he's doing, he's using this as a licking branch. And again, he's marking that, 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 that little twig with the scent from these glands at the base of his antlers. He's also licking it and just putting his scent all up on the, the tree above him, all on the ground below him. And so it's a, a really productive communication tool for deer, but we can really use it as hunters. So keep that in mind, good, good, good stuff. Hey Dan, the question came in. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Curtis. Oh, go with the question. That's that's more important. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, I've heard before that other bucks will use other scrapes that are theirs, or maybe it's not. Maybe that are not theirs. Yeah. So that are not theirs. Uh, do you think there's any truth in that? So we're bucks. I certainly do. Yes. Yes. Especially if a buck feels like he's the dominant buck in that specific area, he will. Like, let's say Jason and I are two deer. He's, I'll, I'll let you be the mature one, Jason, for this example. Oh, nice. And I'm, I'm this young, like two and a half year old, maybe year and a half year old buck. I find Jason scrape. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to steal his women from him. Um, in reality, what's going to happen is that mature buck will try to eventually identify who that younger buck is and try to fight him or just try to push him off. But that is a strategy that a lot of hunters utilize um, is, so this is doe estrus. I guess I'll go ahead and bring this up right now. Um, this is essentially doe in heat. So this is doe urine that's collected during the estrus cycle. So it has those pheromones in it. A lot of hunters will deposit that in the scrape. So now they've essentially acted as the doe in this, this kind of breeding scenario. I've put the scent there and now I'm hoping the buck comes by. There's a lot of other hunters who will kind of view it similarly, but a little bit differently and will actually use buck urine. So instead of trying to draw out that matey, matiness, I guess, um, that, that, you know, breeding desire as opposed to the aggression and fighting desire, I personally have found the aggressive style of trying to market with other buck lure and trying to get the, the big dominant buck. That can be productive if that's your, your primary goal is focused on getting the, the, the biggest, maturest buck in that area. If you're just trying to get a buck on the ground, um, I recommend using does because it's a little bit like turkey hunting. Um, if you've ever been spring turkey hunting, a lot of people recommend don't use a big mature Tom decoy. You want to use a young Jake decoy because the young birds aren't going to come into a big bird because now they know they have to fight him, right? Where if you use a young decoy, every bird, whether it's another young male or even adult male will still come in because, oh, I can beat up a young male. 
kind of the, the same principle there. I know, Curtis, you were going to say something. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, point out that um, the licking branch is important because there are other animals, depending on where you are in the state, that scrape the leaves off the ground. Uh, so turkeys will do that looking for uh, food, you know, acorns and stuff. And uh, even if you're down south where there's pigs, they'll do that. Uh, they'll do that, too. Um, so always check out that licking branch. And then some people now I'm not a big I'm a deer hunter, not a buck hunter. So I'm after something to fill my freezer. But if you are looking for a big buck, you can also look at the disturbance around the licking branch. And this picture is a good example of that. If a deer's rubbing his head all over the place, uh, you'll see little branches and twigs all over broken off. So some people will look for licking branches that are all torn up and be like, okay, there's a big one visiting this one. Yeah, and think of it as like an indicator of antler size almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way people used to do it before trail cameras anyway. <laughs> yeah. And and kind of, you know, getting back to, to you know, scrapes a little bit and that, that question we had. Um, there are, there's a, a big cohort of hunters and I, I think I, believe it as well that will essentially every time that i don't personally do it but every time they come across a scrape while they're out hunting they just instantly urinate in it in the hopes that again they're challenging that other buck that's in that area and forcing him to come back to the scrape on a more regular basis to, in hopes that they can catch him during during daylight hours and I, I think the big theory there is i we as hunters give deer almost this kind of spiritual ephemeral all-knowing entity status in some cases they're in in a lot of cases they're not really that smart and i think in this case they can tell that it's urine i don't necessarily know they know it's a distinction between human versus deer um so to kind of get back to your question just to ask about you know other bucks utilizing that scrape they do so much so that other hunters will actually kind of utilize some of these strategies to to kind of create the illusion that that's naturally happening out there yeah, and uh, we've already talked about it, but I'm definitely pro scent scent drag, uh, doing a doing heat drag to where you want them to walk to. Yeah. Oh yeah, actually we haven't talked about that yet. Oh, really? really? I yeah. So the doing message. Sorry. A little bit, a little bit, but then I kind of like you said earlier. I like to get on these stupid tangents. So outside of acting as a really good, um, you know, smelling salt to get you awake in the morning, doe estrus can be one of the most I think useful products. Again, if you're really focused on getting a buck during rut. The, the challenge with this stuff is knowing when to use it and when not to. There's a lot of people who use doe urine and doe and heat throughout the entirety of, of deer season. You're not really accomplishing anything. Again, deer aren't the smartest critters out there, but their biological clock certainly knows when things should be happening. And if you're out there with doe estrus on October 5th, still well a month away before the first doe will ever enter estrus, they're not gonna really react positively to it. But during pre-rut, so really the next week, week and a half, this stuff can be really productive. Um, again, this is dough in estrus. So it's collected urine that has, you know, some of that estrus pheromone in it or that estrogen in it. Um, but a really good strategy. I've had success with it. I know a few people that I've, I've hunted with or even a few people who have taken a few of our classes have had success with it. And that's identifying a scrape and essentially taking what I like to use is a tampon with a long string attached to it or a cotton swab tied to string, drop a, a few drops of your doe estrus on the cotton swab or on the tampon, drop a few more drops in the scrape and just drag that string with the tampon or the cotton dragging on the ground and drag that all the way to your stand location. And the theory is now a buck comes, checks his scrape, realizes, oh, a doe was an estrus who is here and he's going to immediately start, start trailing her. Um, during the first firearm season, I think it was in 2020, not last year, but the year before I, I had, I did this exact same scenario first week of firearm season. So that's technically after a lot of people would consider peak rut, but I had a, a young two and a half year old, nice little 10 pointer hit the scrape and instantly nose on the ground and just walked straight into my stand. So it can be a very productive strategy, particularly if you're in an area that you're, you're struggling a little bit, you're just not seeing the activity that you should be, um, definitely something worth, worth trying and definitely something to, to keep in mind.
And then just other ways to use it. You can also just use it to cover your scent walking in. I mean, it's the time of year where if a buck hits it, even if it's not on a scrape. Like, yes, yes. I'll get within 50 yards of my scrape and just put it down and, and drag a string behind me with a, with something with it on it, either a cloth or a rag or a, a tampon, like Dan said. And uh, just make sure it doesn't fall off because I've had that happen before you get to your stand. It's <laughs> yeah, not a same. <laughs> um, I, I would but, uh, I would caution. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna say then when you get to your stand, uh, you can also put it using like the cotton swabs around your stand in the cardinal directions. Just get the scent in the area and see what buck comes in. Never put it on yourself or spill it on yourself because we've all seen that video of a of a hunter getting attacked by a deer, um, probably because he had that scent on him. Um, you you want them to be twenty yards away from you, not on top of you. So uh, make sure you have that spread out the proper way. Got it. That's exactly what I was gonna say. So you got it. Nailed it. I would also say keep in mind that all those little cotton swabs are uh, litter, so make sure you do pick those up when yes, you yes take don't, every one. Don't leave them mm -hmm. out there. So it's a really good oh. garbage marker too. Sorry, just to add on to it, to add on to the other benefit of it, you step that off. Make sure it's twenty yards away from where you're at. It, you can use that as a spot. I've I've shot. Yeah, your, that's a really good point. Yep. I'm like that's twenty yards, and it shot him right there. I like it. So now we're we're moving into the seeking phase. So this is essentially where we are right now. This is kind of October 24th through November 5th. Um, and if you've ever taken or heard me talk before um, at, at any of our webinars or workshops or pot, any of it, we get asked quite often if we could pick, you know, one specific day to hunt deer in the year, what would it be? For me, it's fairly simple. Every year, October 31st, it just seems to be one of those magical days where bucks are really starting to move that testosterone is really starting to peak the does aren't quite ready yet but the bucks are really on edge and movement really starts to pick up and that's kind of right in the middle of this window and that that's why i i am such a big fan of this kind of segment of rut more so than peak rut because this is when you're going to see what what most people consider the prototypical rut activity where you just see bucks just everywhere everywhere now they're not necessarily chasing yet they, they'll certainly start harassing does, but at this point in time, does are still fairly unreceptive. They haven't entered their, their estrus cycle, and so they're rather unamused with the attention that the bucks are giving them. So they're still kind of focusing on that, that standard, I'm going from bed to feed, and then from feed back to bed, where the bucks, that this is when they, they really, really, really start moving. But this is when you're going to see the bucks increase their home range a little bit. This is when... I, I personally don't run trail cameras this time of year. All my trail cameras, I still have a few out just because I haven't got to them yet, but I pull everything in because this is the time of year where bucks are going to start showing up that you've never seen before anyway. And so a lot of that trail camera knowledge you kind of had is a little bit lost at this point. Obviously, your scouting still plays because they're still using the same, using the travel, same travel corridors travel. and things like that. But um, I'm not really running any trail cameras trying to identify any bucks. What I'm really focused on is spending as much time in the stand as I can because anything can happen this time of year. Um, this is a, a buck I actually took a picture of at uh, Clinton Lake State Recreation Area. So this this was like six years ago, so he's long gone by now. But there are some really quality bucks on on a lot of these public sites, and especially this next week or two. Uh, you have a really good shot at, at, at getting an encounter with them, getting an encounter with lots of activity, and just having the hunt of a lifetime. Um, so seeking phase can be really productive. Focus again on what I like to say, and, and Curtis will get into this in the strategies a little bit more, on the downwind side of bedding areas. Because during the seeking and chasing phase, really all a buck is doing is doing a, a giant inventory of his core range and identifying where does are bedding, where does are feeding, and he's developing a system to start scent checking these constantly. And that's really all he's going to be doing these next few weeks is trying to cover as much ground as he can, lo locate these does, scent check them to see if any are receptive to breed. If not, he moves on to the next bedding or feeding area and he just continues that cycle. Hey, Dan, in that picture, the buck there, uh, yeah, is that the the one with the muley fork? Is that his uh, is that his left side or is that the G two on the right side? That's the left G two. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. With yeah, he's, he was a dandy up there. And was he chasing a doe when you took that picture? He was. Yes, he yeah. was. Yeah, he's got that run that 
Yeah, you can see the pant a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. That looks like me after a barbecue running to the back. <laughs> and unfortunately, that booger was in a no hunting area. And he uh-huh. I, he spent quite a bit of time on private land, and I tried to get access for a, l- a couple weeks with, with no luck. But he, he was certainly cool, and I was glad to get pictures of him. But then we move into this chasing phase, and this is when it really ramps from, like, 90 miles an hour to Mach 2. This is when there are some does that are getting very close to estrus. The testosterone levels are starting to peak in the bucks, and they are – really focused on nothing other than than finding a receptive doe to breed. Um, it's common for mature bucks to, to lose 15 to even more, in some cases, percent of their body weight during rut. Because, um, again, he's not worried about feeding. He's just worried about breeding as many does as he possibly can. And, Curtis, do you want to touch on the, the concept of buck-to-doe ratio real quick? I think you say that quite well. Mm-hmm. I think it'll explain a few things here. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in some places where the buck to doe ratio is way off, and by uh, saying that, I mean there's way too many does for every buck, uh, that bucks have actually run themselves to death in the rut because there's there's so many does to tend. And, um, That's wild. And so another thing about it, when the buck to doe ratio is that off, you also have a, a lot more suboptimal males that are mating, which is not the way it's supposed to be in nature. You know, it's supposed to be pretty even or even maybe a little uh, skewed towards bucks because they're a little bit bigger and, and better uh, able to get away from some predators. And so uh, just the big adult males, you know, the ones with good genetics, the ones that are healthy are supposed to breed, but with, uh, with a whole bunch of does and not that many bucks, then all that kind of goes out the window. And um, yeah, so a healthy buck to doe ratio, if you do happen to be lucky enough to have your own property that you're managing, you definitely want to be taking does and you might need to take a lot of does because the hunting get so much better if you can get that ratio down yes. to close to 50%. You'll start to see things like calling and rattling actually be effective. And, oh, it's just, it, it's a whole different hunting experience. But I know not many of us have uh, uh, that type of opportunity. But if you do, consider yourself lucky and take full advantage. Shoot those does. Yeah, but but like Curtis said, calling is one of those things that, the, the tighter that buck to doe ratio is, the more beneficial and more productive it is simply because if there's a ton of does out there per buck, he doesn't really need to, to worry about fighting off other bucks to get to breed does. He's going to be able to breed realistically as many as he could anyway. Um, so, but one thing I, I do want to kind of stress about this, this kind of seeking and chasing phase almost to, together for lack of a better term. Uh, but a, a quick story about, I shot that buck in Missouri in 20. 17 um, but a cool story that, that kind of highlights how focused these bucks are on breeding so i was sitting there about two o'clock in the afternoon i was in northern missouri up in my stand ready to go and here comes a doe just tearing through about as fast as she could run and she runs and stops at about 12 yards and again this is two o'clock in the afternoon i had just been up for maybe 15 20 minutes i was still getting things out of my pack and getting situated and i start to see her her do what i talked about earlier just kind of constantly looking over her shoulder her ear was constantly both of them were just I mean facing behind her the entire time and she's kind of moving them around trying to listen for everything so I knew there was something behind her right I knew something was trailing her and so I gave her a, a little bit of time she moved off about 60 yards and here comes this buck who was just right on her tail I get him stopped at about probably 11 ish yards and I draw back and the arrow was not correctly knocked on my string and fell out of the ground. I was in a metal ladder stand. The arrow hit the ladder rungs on the way down, just boing, boing, making that clacking metal sound. I was able to grab another arrow out of a quiver, finally draw and make a clean shot all before he even reacted because he was so focused on that one doe that he was following. Everything else around him, completely, completely oblivious to. Um, And that's just kind of the, the level of of hormone driven behavior we're seeing this time of year that they are again just focused on literally nothing but but breeding oh i almost yelled at him as they ran by right behind a doe trying to get him to stop 
I mean, they will, they're, they're on the does and they, they are, care yes. what's happening. They are just yes. going, going, going. I mean, I've been, I've been, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop. Yeah. Wait a second. <laughs> Is that your duck call? <laughs> That's it. No. Oh. And then we hit. I might want to leave that at right. home at December. <laughs> No, Dan, was that buck the one that's over your left shoulder? Yeah, this. Wait, the other one. This one. Oh, it's that one? Yeah. The same one in the picture in the last slide? No, it, it actually is a different picture. They look oh, very. Oh, I did okay. take that picture at the same farm, so the genetics are probably pretty okay. close. Yeah. But now we're in peak rut, so this is when stuff gets, in my opinion, a little bit slow. And again, this is when I usually will kind of, get a few chores done at home, you know, go through the inbox, get what I need to get done at work. Cause I, I normally take off the prior week, take vacation and spend as much time in the tree as I can. These next few days, this is what we call the, essentially the lockdown. And this is when the actual breeding is occurring. This is when a buck is tending a doe, things slow down. Um, obviously we say buck movement will break wide open. It's really hit or miss. It can be like one day that is just freaking amazing. You'll see more posts on Facebook than you've ever seen about deer hitting the ground, big bucks being killed. And then the next day, everyone's like, where in the heck did everything go? And it happens very, very quickly. If you move to the next slide real quick, Jason. And this is why it happens, because this is when they are essentially actively breeding. We hit that, that peak estrus right off after the chasing. So that's when the bucks are, are starting to identify those first does in estrus. They're starting to harass them, starting to chase them. And now at this stage, she is now receptive to breed and they're going off to, to do their own thing. And when they are tending and when he's actively breeding her, he will be with that indi individual doe for up to 48 hours in some cases, uh, more typically 24 to 36 hours, uh, but it, it can go even past 48 hours. Um, and typically they're going to breed several times during this process, but they are going to be in the thickest, hardest to find habitat, hardest to hunt habitat that's out there. They're not going to get up and go feed. They're not going to get up and go get a huge drink. Now they may get up and kind of stretch their legs and feed about kind of the, the little area they're in, but they're really going to stay in this nice little kind of bedroom and then spend the next, you know, 24 to 36 hours with the, the jazz going and the wine out and the cheese and crackers and he's going to breed her as many times as he can. When he realizes he's done breeding with her, he's going to get up, she's going to leave, and he's going to go try to find another one to start the entire process over. Did you take that picture, Dan? I did. This is actually, if you go back, that's actually the exact same buck that had the split G2 that you were talking about on the mule deer side. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, so this man. was, he chased that doe, and he chased her into this thicket, and I assume they were probably going to, to start running or breeding in there but yeah look at that dark cat man got killer yeah cat. he was cool no wonder he's popular with the does yeah. <laughs> and we do have this concept of a second rut or a second estrus and so 28 days after that that first estrus cycle any doe that was either a unsuccessfully bred or B just didn't breed um, will now enter a second estrus cycle. And this is again about 28 days after that first one. So you can kind of view this as mid-December for, for lack of a better term. Um, you will also see some of the fawns uh, from the previous year start entering sexual maturity and some of those will also enter an estrus cycle during this, this second rut. Um, however, and that is kind of what's interesting about deer ecology and deer anatomy is, is their ability to breed really essentially largely revolves around their overall body size. And so if they hit a, a certain body condition, those fawns can actually be receptive to breed at about the six to seven month age old time when, when obviously from the year prior. Um, now, it's not as intense as that, that first rut, but you can see a little bit of breeding activity and you can still use some of these processes throughout um, but I, a lot of times during the second rut, I really don't focus much on rut strategies. I kind of shift back towards that, that bed to feed. Um, cause like Curtis said, in this, in many cases, these bucks have lost so much body weight that they need to rebuild these fat reserves before winter. And so I try to capitalize on that feeding behavior a little bit more than the second rut. Cause I find the second rut to be a little bit more sporadic and very hard to predict 
um, where you can really easily get back on that bed to feed pattern once once kind of that that first rut's over. Basically, like I just said. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to Curtis. All right, now we'll actually get into some actual strategies here. I'm going to move my little window so I can see what I'm looking at. But here is an example. We're talking about basically the seeking chase, chasing phase here. And one of the best things that you can do is to position yourself at the downwind side of a doe bedding area. Uh, because that is a quick way that a roaming buck can kind of scent check all the does that are there to see where they're at, to see if somebody's getting close to estrus, uh, just kind of use their nose. It's kind of like, I guess, people using uh, uh, social media to check up and see <laughs> who's going out tonight. A deer can get all that information just from their nose. And so they can just walk on the downwind side and find out where all those does are in their estrus cycle. So posi positioning yourself on a trail just on the downwind side of a, of a hot doe bedding area, super effective strategy. And we'll uh, be coming back to this time and time again because, uh, I, I mean, it, it's tough to beat this strategy really on, on almost all uh, phases of the rut right up until the, the peak estrus and even a little bit beyond. So uh, hunting cold fronts, hunting a change in the weather is always good in the rut. This is just exacerbated because deer are already wanting to move. They've got those kind of um, um, hormone drivers that are wanting them to move. So when they get the proper environmental conditions to do that, it can be just electric. So uh, this time of year, and like Dan said, really starting close to now and going until uh, you know, we get several days into November, maybe into November 10th, 14th, somewhere into there, it's going to be good. And any time that we get a good cold front on the front end and on the back end, uh, that's going to spur animal movement, deer movement as well. But everything, you'll see everything in the woods moving. You might be out there and see bobcats and coyotes and foxes and uh, just everything in the, in the wild will move. And what I really like to look for is when you find nights that are not conducive for animal movement but then the next day is fairly nice you know crisp clean cool the front has moved through i really love those days because i know the night before maybe the wind was howling uh, super cloudy spitting rain obviously deer will still move in that but it's going to be a lot lower than a nice night so the next day that's gonna uh the movement's even going to be that much more increased because all the last night those bucks were just going wild wanting to scent check all these does and they couldn't because uh conditions were suboptimal so really look for those changes in weather and this applies uh really to any critter you might be hunting and any time of year but like I said, exacerbated during the rut because movement is just already dialed up to 10. And if, if you've looked at the extended forecast much, it doesn't look like it's going to be great. Um, but I, I do get a little excited because it is, we are going to experience a little warm front is getting ready to come through. Um, throughout next weekend, we're going to hit in the 70s for the highs. The lows are going to be in the, the low 60s to upper 50s. So it's going to get warm. I will be, like Curtis just said, the first day after that warm front, whenever that, that load drops, that's when I'm going to be out in, the, out in the woods, right on that, that changing weather pattern. So be looking for that because it's probably going to come just looking at the forecast for the next few days, how warm it's going to get. We're probably going to have a, a, a changing weather pattern right on the backside of that is my guess. Yeah. How about the rain on Sunday? You guys think about sitting in the rain on Sunday? I just went back aside, I, by the way, but just uh, not to throw Curtis off, but go ahead. I love hunting in the rain, yep. personally. I think I'll be out. My, uh, I, 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 if it's lightning, no, 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 no. But yeah, rain, yeah, of course, I'm be safe. It. it also depends on the rain. Like if it's yeah. one of the, uh, you know, long soaking fall rains that's just sprinkling, yeah, I love hunting in that. But if it's, 
anything more than that, it's it's hard for me to bow hunt in it because, I, yeah, just it, it's a it's a condition I don't practice in, so it's a condition I'm not super comfortable shooting in. Sure. Um, we did have a question for the Q and A. Uh, we, this is the past slide that we just had, and uh, they said, "How far off of this are you trying to set up off the buck trail here?" <clears throat> Well, it depends on on the topography and what's there. There should be a trail there. And a lot of times bucks, so when we think of deer trails, we're thinking of deer trails that look like cow trails. We're looking for the best used, biggest used trail out there. And uh, those are awesome, but there's also a lot lighter game trails that you have to be really paying attention to see. There's going to be a trail there that that buck uses. He's not just walking right through the woods. So you're going to find wherever that game trail is that parallels that opening and, and be on that wherever it is. Uh, usually it's going to be within sight, but um, it, that's going to depend on yeah a lot of things right there at the area. But find the trail, even if it's a faint one, that the buck will walk down that. Yeah, and yeah. it's not uncommon to on on kind of the the outer skirts of a doe bedding area to find some fairly solidified rub lines. Um, I think that's a, a fairly common thing I've seen, especially along Illinois public land. It seems like that that's a fairly common trend. And another thing we can point out with this example here, again, looking at these contour lines, we're using the the terrain to help kind of predict where that buck is going to be. And obviously, we kind of have these converging lines. If you can kind of show where this valley is, Jason, with your cursor, because I know they'll be able to see your cursor. So we know that's kind of a, a drainage ditch or a valley where it's going down, right? So if we can think about what scent is going to do leaving that bedding area, a lot of times it's just going to kind of stay relatively horizontal. There may be some, you know, vertical movement a little bit, but he wants to make sure he's up high enough. If he was in that drainage ditch, he's not getting any of that scent. That scent's blowing over top of him. So he's going to try to get in an area where he can actually still scent check that, that doe bedding area. So oftentimes, like Curtis said, you'll find a trail usually within, I hate to give a number, but probably 50 yards outside of that bedding area. Within that, you're going to find at least some kind of trail that, that he's utilizing more commonly than not. It'll be kind of in the midway point of that, about 25 yards from the edge of that field. Because um, especially bucks, they like to stick in cover when they're moving. And so he's going to utilize that cover to the best of his ability. And oftentimes it's going to be thick, close along that edge. And he can kind of use that as a nice little screen on the backside. And then setting up from where you want to be at off this trail is within bow range. Yep. Um, you yep. want to shoot him. You want to shoot him off that trail. So that's going to be the area that we expect him to walk. And that's going to be the area you want within your bow range. And now, obviously, this is a pretty textbook exa example. We want that buck to walk this way. That doesn't always happen, but that's yeah. when that calling can really become beneficial. And you can utilize a little grunt, just burr, burr, not too aggressive. Again, we don't want a blind call. We don't want to just call into the void because what happens in those cases, you almost become the, the prey, right? So I want to be the one looking out for the deer. I don't want the deer coming in knowing that I'm here. I don't want them to have any inhibition that they're already looking or on alert for something because they oftentimes if they hear a vocalization just like we have this example of a buck doing they'll try to circle downwind of that sound and if you're just up there clanking antlers together and he sneaks behind you and you never even knew he was there well now he smelled you he's gone and he's probably not going to fall for your trap next time um, so calling can be good especially in a situation like this if they're not perfectly walking down that trail just a couple soft little grunts see how he reacts to it if his ears turn back and he puffs up his neck and all the hair on his neck stands up that's when you grab your bow because he's coming in to challenge but if he just kind of looks at it goes back to feeding kind of looks at it goes back to feeding then i i honestly don't do a lot more calling i just let let it play out and see how that works and hope that he's going to follow along that trail yeah, any of these maps that we have tonight, just kind of think of them like hurricane maps, where there's like a large swath of area here that like they can come <laughs> along come here <laughs> and then funnel this way. They can go that way. They can come this way. So yeah, realistic. Ooh, another another nice buck there. With some, that's the same like, one. <laughs> that's the same one about two weeks stuff. later. Oh yeah, that's a good from the front. And that's a good uh, good point when you're getting trail camera photos. Another reason why setting them on a something like a scrape is really good because you generally get multiple pictures of the same deer. 
because they definitely can look far different from the side, from the front, from yeah. the back, having multiple angles. If you are somebody who are is looking for maybe the uh, biggest buck in your area and you're holding out for that, uh, get multiple pictures because sometimes the biggest buck from the side is not the biggest buck from the front or uh, in the back of your truck. So multiple pictures are good. Uh, but don't forget about scouting. Even though the season is on and it's hot, uh, deer are moving. And so we don't want to completely forget about scouting. Now, like Dan mentioned, we all hunt uh, you know, primarily public land. And so you don't want to be walking around and, and bumping into other hunters. But if you utilize the middle part of the day where not many people are hunting, um, you're generally not going to run into anybody. It's, you know, maybe just Dan sitting out there and he'll be okay. It's not going to ruin his whole hunt because uh, five minutes after you walk by, the woods will calm down and it'll be back to normal. But uh, definitely don't scout at peak hunting times during peak, uh, you know, peak uh, hunting time of the year, which would be now until uh, basically through mid-November. But don't forget about scouting altogether because you can get so hung up on one spot that you really think is the good spot, but maybe things have changed a little bit, a little bit of pressure, move patterns, maybe does are utilizing different feed or bed than you're thinking about. And uh, you definitely don't want to be so stuck on one spot that you forget to check other ones and, and you miss something cool. So uh I always like to utilize at least uh, take a longer walk out if you're hunting in the morning, maybe instead of walking straight back to your truck, uh, make a big loop and check out some other areas and just see what's going on because you don't want to miss anything. And this is a time of year when sign is going to be laid down pretty heavy. So uh, uh, it's a good chance you might find something new and at least you're adding to your knowledge of the property. You're also giving yourself other spots to go when inevitably you show up and maybe somebody's hunting close to your your a spot so now now you've got some other spots to go check out so calling and rattling we already talked about this this is far far better if your buck to doe ratio is good meaning you've got a high high bucks to doe ratio um, but this is, this is definitely something that's worth trying. I personally have never really had it uh, work. I, 99% uh, of the deer that are shot in the Midwest are complete <laughs> ambush. Um, you, you're sitting and waiting and the deer walks by. There's no calling, none of that probably for, yeah, over 99%. But my brother has had it work out and when it does work, it's cool. Because you you see a buck out there that's not coming into range and maybe you lightly rattle and then like Dan said hair comes up on the back the the buck starts, you know, walking in threatening posture and and looks like a completely different animal. You know what did look like a sleek white tailed deer now looks like a big bull that's ready to tear somebody's head off and it, it's kind of cool just to see that and see that uh, that change in front of you so. Um, he had that work. This is the time of year when it definitely can work. And the one thing I usually say about calling is if I almost think it's more for you than the deer, if that gives you confidence, then yes, break them out and use them because it's going to keep you in the woods. And that's what, uh, especially when I was a kid, I used to use it to keep me in the woods longer, which let's face it, that's more uh, responsible for success than, than probably knowledge or most things you can think of certainly equipment or anything like that um but yeah it's um anyway forgot where i was going with that but <laughs> colin can be can be really fun when it does work out so if it does keep you out there it's worth it and yeah yes. what i was saying is like when i was a kid if i'd get to the point where all right i'm bored i'm ready to go home maybe then i would bust out and do a little bit of calling and it would keep me there for 30 more minutes Maybe then I do it again and it keeps me there for 30 more minutes. So maybe the calling didn't do anything at all, but if it keeps me out there for another hour, hour and a half that maybe I wouldn't have done otherwise, then, then it's probably served its purpose. I do want to, to kind of dissect this map a little bit, just because it, it's an area I've hunted and I kind of mapped it out a little bit, but you can see where I kind of marked this, this rub line. 
And this is essentially what I call almost like a ridge point. If you've taken some of our other deer workshops, you've heard us talk about ridge point bedding. And essentially it's when you have, you know, a, a finger of a ridge that kind of leans out into a, a valley. Bucks really, really, really like to spend time bedding in those areas. Uh, they feel very safe and secure. And so in this specific instance, I, I do want to highlight obviously that, that kind of ridge point bedding example, but also where I would set up or where you could set up if you were to try to rattle. Um, like we've kind of talked about a, a few times, I know Curtis mentioned it and I mentioned it, deer often like to circle downwind of anything they're trying to identify. That's their, their biggest sense is their sense of smell and they're going to use that to their fullest advantage. And if you're calling, that buck or that doe is going to try to circle downwind. That's just what's going to happen. And so if you're, you know, your strategy is I want to rattle today, try to set up in an area that does not allow that buck to try to sneak downwind of you. And so you can see in this example, I'm about two thirds up the, the side of a slope. Now that buck could certainly want to, he could go around and come up the back of that slope that's a lot of work. And again, deer are fairly lazy by nature. And so you may force that buck to take a route that allows him to, to you know, get into your effective range before he circles downwind of you. Because every time you call, that's going to be his first move is to try to circle downwind. And if you can use the terrain or the landscape to block that, you can really set yourself up. Sure. Good tip if you're ever uh, hunting, uh, calling coyotes too. They'll yeah even more important that they're always going to try to circle downwind so that's that's a different webinar but also keep in mind if you're just hunting deer uh, some of these things can deter some of the younger animals because they don't want to get beat up you know and so um especially you'll see a call out there called the snort wheeze that's like a dominant buck type of call and uh, if you do that, <clears throat> any small buck that uh, you might be happy to get uh, is going to turn tail and, and run. So Yeah. Now, I will say, I've had some success rattling. I've, I've never harvested a buck doing it, but I would, I would probably say 100% of the deer that I've had to come in to rattle are very young bucks, and they never come completely in or they never try to circle downwind. They're not they know that they would get their butt kicked if they did that. And so it's very common to have a, a young buck come to like 150, 100 yards and just just look. You know, just he's like that that high school teenager, everyone, fight, fight, fight. So he just comes and he just wants to watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. So funny. Yeah, and so now to take that a step further, you could also incorporate a decoy. And now we're pretty much talking about the private land hunters, because uh, if you're hunting public land, I really don't recommend you use a decoy. Might it be effective? Sure, it might. But um, there's also an inherent risk that comes with that, because now you're putting out something that other hunters might be looking for um, in front of you. It's also really big and a hard thing to carry through the woods, um, and and it's gonna it's gonna be so hard to keep your human scent off of that. I've never personally used one. I I've seen videos where people have had good luck with it, but generally this is people on private land. And what it really does is if you are out there calling, it gives the deer something to focus on that's not you. So you can get away with a lot more movement uh, utilizing a decoy than you could without. Because remember, you're making deer sound. So when that buck comes in, he's expecting to see a deer. When he doesn't see that, now he's looking, he's circling downwind, he's trying to figure out what's going on. So the idea of a decoy is when he sees that, now there's no reason to circle downwind. Hopefully he smells it. You've uh, sprayed some, some deer scent on that. And uh, he's just going to come and challenge that buck without circling downwind, giving you a perfect shot. And um, that's the hope. I, I've never used one. Dan, have you ever hunted over it? <laughs> I, I have. When I first started getting into to hunting, I was uh, probably 14 or 15 at the time. It was when Primos was the, the big company and they, they released all their big buck DVDs. And I, I fell in love with that 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 company and, and watching their hunts and they got me hooked. Oh, I, got, I got to buy a decoy. I have to try it. So I tried it once. Um, my decoy was literally ruined within the first hunt. 
I was stupid. I left it out overnight. I did not know at the time. I was again, 14, 15. I did not know that was a thing that you're not supposed to do. But I came back in the morning to my decoy being in pieces and scattered across the field. And obviously the, the, the primary thought is a buck found it at night, thought it was another buck and he just destroyed it. So <laughs> I never replaced it after that. That was, that was a, enough experience for me. Well, on the bright side, that buck probably talked about that night for all of his days. <laughs> you, know, you should have seen this one fight. I, was, I tore this guy to pieces. <laughs> okay, so we already talked about the problem with scrapes. They look juicy and exciting, and they get a lot of visitation, but it's so much at night. But this is one time of year where they may be inclined to visit it during the day because it's the same uh, reason why they're going downwind of doe breeding areas. They're just trying to scent check as many deer as possible. And uh, deer are using scrapes as a, a basically a message board so they get a chance to scent check any does that might be in the area uh, by going there. So this is the one time of year where, uh, again, probably the downwind side of doe bedding areas is your number one. But if that you don't have access to that, hunting over a scrape can definitely work because they're going to be the guard's going to be a little bit down this time of year. They've got the hormones that are telling them to go check on these does, even though uh, their brain's probably telling them it's it's not a, a wise decision. <laughs> And like we've been talking about this whole time, if you're hunting bucks, you got to hunt does because that's what the bucks are going to. So I know we, we talked about feed to bed and all this. Well, at this time of year, if you're hunting bucks, just forget about all that because largely the buck is not thinking really about bedding or feeding. All he's thinking about is does and when they're going to come into estrus and be in there first to try to secure that lockdown period. So uh, find out where the does are bedding, where they're feeding, and be downwind of it. Um, so if you don't have access to the great bedding areas, but you do know feeding areas, you can definitely get just downwind of that and hunt it. Anywhere that does frequent, whether it's bedding area, feeding area, or maybe a scrape that everybody's visiting, uh, it, all bets are off this time of year. Anywhere that the does are, that's where the bucks are gonna be. And like Dan said, bucks that you've never seen all year. I don't care if you got cameras out all year and you think you know every deer on your property, this time of year, surprises show up. And actually, the if you look at the deer collar studies, this comes up. Um, find some studies where they put collars on mature bucks and look at their movement during rut. And it's Miles. amazing how yeah, all year, maybe they're living in a core home range that's, uh, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe 500, 600 acres, 1000 acres, <clears throat> something like that. But all of a sudden, during the rut, maybe they move 12 miles to the east for some strange reason. And now they're hanging out over there. And then afterwards, they're back in their core home range. So it's just that short period of time where they do these sort of, I guess you can call them elongated uh, migrations just to find receptive does. So um, again, just get in the woods, whatever keeps you there, try to stay downwind of where does are hanging out and you're going to probably have a good time. Dan, do you remember off the top of your head the percent body weight they lose during rut? I, I know Double off digits. the top of my head, I, I feel safe saying 15 to 18%. I feel like yeah. it is higher than that, but I don't want to quote it higher than that in case I'm incorrect. But yeah, I mean, like Curtis said, they can run themselves to death. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, around the yeah, cover. it is. And especially, you know, th especially during the estrus or kind of right in front of it, you're going to have one doe that hits estrus early. And if you're anywhere near that doe, that first doe in heat in kind of the, the, the habitat that you're around, you literally may see eight to 12 different bucks in a single day, all walking the same trail, which is where that first doe walked because she was in estrus. So like Curtis said, during the, this time of year, they can move miles and they will to find that first receptive doe. And every buck in that area is going to be interested in her. We had a question in the Q&A. Um, it was wondering yep. if uh, we ever had any luck or uh, would advise using active drip uh, scrape. So putting an active drip on a scrape 
Good question. Uh, I can go first and then Curtis, if you have any thoughts. Um, I have used them quite a bit. I, I personally don't utilize them now uh, because I, I grew up hunting privately and we had a, a private farm in Missouri that's no longer in our family. And now in Illinois, I, I hunt exclusively publicly. And so I don't use them a ton anymore. Uh, but historically, I did have a little bit of decent success with them, I guess. Um, I felt like it more consistently brought bucks back to, to continue freshening up the, these scrapes. Um, obviously, I don't have any, you know, this is all kind of anecdotal, um, not necessarily statistical or anything like that. But I did feel like it did cause those bucks to be a little bit more consistent in their travel routes to freshen up and check on these scrapes um, where those those scrapes without it weren't visited as frequently and again we're not talking a lot here maybe an, an extra visit a week or something which still it's it's primarily going to be between that two and kind of 4 a.m so it can be really good if if you have a really productive scrape or if it's a scrape that you just really want to kind of use as a photo booth almost that's kind of what i started to turn it into in our, our our farm in missouri was i would put one on a scrape we would never hunt that scrape we would just leave that scrape alone and kind of use it as as our inventory um, cause at the time we owned that Missouri farm, we had a deer antler restriction. So we had to ensure that every buck had at least three or at least four points over an inch. And so at that time it was very critical for us to have a decent idea of what bucks were around just so that if we saw one in the field, we kind of instantly knew, no, that one, you know, he's a big six, you'll think he's legal, but he's not technically legal. And so for us, we kind of used it as that, that photo booth, just the inventory, the, the deer on the property. I found it to be successful for that. In terms of, of hunting on public land, I don't know that I would even use it these days. Um, again, that's just kind of my opinion. I don't know if you've got any thoughts, Curtis. Yeah, I've never really utilized one, but yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if you put a sign up in your yard and somebody continuously keeps taking it, you're probably going to patrol your yard more to Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. To well try said. to find yeah, who's taking your sign, so makes sense. All right, and like Dan mentioned earlier, this is definitely the time to hunt all day if you can. So this is the time to hunt like whenever you can, whatever time you have, even if you just have a break during the middle part of the day, go out there because any part of the day is worth being out there. You're not going to get a deer from your couch. That's well, I shouldn't say that. Some of you might be out in the country. But it <laughs> might be possible. If so, call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have have uh, have ammo. We'll travel, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's sitting out there all day. And like Dan said, a high percentage of large bucks are shot in the middle part of the day and especially on public. And it's it's just like he said, you know, these deer have been around for a while. They know the safe times today, uh, the safe times to move. And just like they know at nighttime is safe. They also know that generally in the middle part of the day is safe because all the hunters are gone. So uh, even on private land, you know, we noticed that it, as kids, a lot of people were getting the big bucks in the middle part of the day when um, competition was high, like after firearm season would start. So uh, definitely something to that. And um, yeah hunt whenever you can but if you have vacation at work that's burning a hole in your pocket this is the time to take it sometime between now and mid-november and spend all the time you can in the woods and you'll probably be rewarded even if you don't wind up harvesting a deer you're you're going to get the type of stories and experiences that'll kind of fuel your your obsession with deer hunting and and keep you going right into next year and next year you'll be better prepared, more scouting, and, and it just kind of builds like that for most people. So don't keep your expectations. If this is your first year hunting low, I, I bow hunted for six years before I got a deer. So for six years, and that's on private, private land, almost all of it. actually the first deer I shot was on public land with my bow, but uh, most of those first six years were all on private. And I, I never, yeah, I never even fired a shot. I had to think of that. I did fire two shots at turkeys and missed, but uh, yeah, turkeys someday. <laughs> Honestly, I fall into the same vein too. It took me probably six or seven years before I finally harvested that first one with a bow. But then, you know, every year since then, it's become not easy, but a little bit easier. The decision making becomes easier. Um, I know when I first started, especially during rut, you get so focused on just 
almost obsessing over every little piece of movement. And I think that that's really important to bring up during these, these all day hunts is find things that allow you to relax because hunting is exhausting. Um, especially during rut, if you're going to put in, you know, a three or four day in a row, full day sits, it's going to tax you. It's going to be exhausting. Even though you're literally just sitting there all day, you're on high alert. Every, your eyes, you're straining, your ears, you're listening, you're smelling for stuff. You're always, every scent is heightened, trying to give you every little advantage you have. And so it becomes very, very mentally taxing. So just kind of be prepared for, for that, for all day sits. And like Curtis said, if you if calling keeps you in the stand longer do it um if moving to a different spot after a few hours keeps you sitting longer it gives you more confidence do it um me personally when i'm doing an all day sit i like to be in kind of the same spot um and i'll move to the next spot the next day but again if anything that can keep you longer in the field the better off you're you're really going to be especially the next few weeks I just got to say that uh, I, my first time ever archery hunting, I got a crossbow when I was 18 in Pennsylvania. And, uh, Did I freeze I said, out? Uh, you look frozen. Can you guys Hello? hear me okay, though? Yeah, I can hear you, Jason. <laughs> okay, I can hear you, Curtis. Dan, are you there? Oh. How are you doing, Dan? I don't know. Curtis, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Keep going with your story there. Sure. You're 18, My story you was got a crossbow. You're got you're, a crossbow. The world 18. is your oyster. Yep, and yeah. uh, got uh, my first deer harvested at seven o'clock in the morning, first day of uh, archery season <laughs> in Pennsylvania, sure. and it was the biggest yeah. buck I've ever gotten. So, uh, well, it was all sometimes it, from there. See, yeah, sometimes it works yeah, out. And then you're chasing build that. Slow. Build slow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. I have no idea when I dropped out, but whatever. It's all right. Anyway, just tell them that I got my first deer, first time I ever went archery hunting. Nice. Yeah, that's impressive. In the that doesn't happen often. Dude, it was crazy. I was I remember <laughs> it vividly and uh I, I shot it. I was literally I had a big tree in front, a big tulip tree in front of me, and then it came, I never saw it, it came straight at that tulip tree. I could see to the right of it for freaking yards to the left of it for yards, and this thing just popped out right at 20 yards on the other yeah. side of the tulip tree, shot it, and then uh I went back to the truck, called my dad up, he was hunting on another property. And he came over and I'm like, yeah, I shot it. I don't know where it's at. And it was piled up by the, by the trail. I mean, I knew exactly where it was. And then we went walking. I'm still taking off my clothes. It was still cold out. And I took all my layers off and he walked back dressed like a snowman. And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, dude, you could have told me to take my clothes off to drag it out. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't want to break up the surprise. What do you want? Yeah, that's good. All right, so now we're on to the next uh, phase. So now we're getting into this lockdown period, which is a good time to get your chores done, maybe get out of the woods. Uh, but if you are dead set on hunting, you're hardcore deer hunting, you're not ready to start, you know, duck hunting or squirrel hunting yet. This is the time where you want to find really thick cover because the uh, you the does uh, when they're receptive and they're going to be in that 24 to 48 hour lockdown period they want to be in the thickest stuff possible uh, because their wits are not going to be about them quite like they are normally when they're undergoing several breeding and and the bucks chasing the doe around she's paying attention to him he's paying attention to her that could be a a time where they're susceptible to not only human hunters but the other predators that run around illinois coyotes and bobcats are definitely big enough they don't take a lot of adult deer uh, but this is a time of year also really late in the winter if we get bad snow those are the two time of a year when it might be uh, the most likely so uh, certainly find the thickest stuff out there and uh, just wait. It can be a waiting game. It's certainly not as productive as, as the days leading up to it, but also other deer will be coming to check on that doe. Other bucks that are not paired up with the doe, they're going to be moving around. So it, if you're dead set on deer hunting, it's definitely not a time to just sit and do nothing, um, but it's less productive than the times around it in general. And Jason, I just noticed the next two slides are duplicates, so you can just skip these next two. There you go. All right, so the second estrus, this is smaller than the first, but 28 days after the first, uh, there will be another cycle. So any does who were not successfully bred, 
and this um and then also any young of the year like dan said that maybe just reach sexual maturity might come into estrus during this period so there is some of that but in general you're back to more of the uh the generalized bed to feed patterns during this time of year uh you certainly can do the downwind of of doe bedding areas but uh, this classic example, the map up here, I like how it looks like two lungs and then you're sitting right at the heart. <laughs> that reminds you to aim small, miss small, I think. But uh, if you've got a funnel that good between two areas where animals frequent, no reason to hunt anywhere but there, in my opinion. And then uh, post rut, this is another time to scout because these, the deer, their patterns are going to change throughout the year. So you might have a really good idea of where they feed and where they bed during October and November, but we start getting after that and things change and um, it, it becomes a little easier to scout because deer start to group up and they start to get in big herds and you can sometimes find really good trails and you can find food sources where they really get uh, congregated around that food source and uh, this is starts to be the time of year when you drive past a field and you might see 40 50 deer out there uh, so obviously it's late late season um, a lot of hunters have already packed it up, called it quits for the year, but um, if you still have some room in your freezer, it can be an awesome time to hunt. You can find some congregated animals, and uh, if you do find that field where 50 or 60 are coming out to it, you can have a lot of fun, even though it's, it's outside the typical, um, you know, hot rut time. Yeah, we had a participant uh, get a lottery for hunting Kickapoo Campground. Um, we suggest anyone uh, apply for that because it's a great opportunity. It's down in central Illinois. And I actually uh, got an email about that today, so I'm glad you brought that up. Remind me after you're done to talk about it. Sure. Um, just that uh, Dan was able to go out with him. We got a video of him harvesting a very nice doe uh, out of a field, and the field looked like this upper picture here where there's about 40 deer. That's I mean, literally the field. There. That that's is the, the same field. field. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's what he had to pick from. It's like, all right, which one would you like? <laughs> and yeah. uh, so, I mean, they group up in late in the late, late December timeframe, which uh, can be really exciting to watch. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. But um, we are able, we have kind of partnered, quote unquote, partnered with Illinois DNR to offer a mentored hunting opportunity for uh, Kickapoo State Recreation Area, which again, I understand not everybody may be, you know, local here in the East Central Illinois area. Uh, but if you are, or if you're willing to to travel, obviously it's pretty close to Champaign. So there's a lot of hotels. Uh, Kickapoo itself also does have a campground. Um, but during December and January, we're going to be doing some mentored hunting opportunities. Um, it is going to be by lottery application because historically we usually get a a pretty decent applicant pool. I think last year we had about 120 people apply. Um, so please submit an application. It's not open yet, uh, but since you signed up to this event, you will be added to our newsletter and we'll have uh, an update for that uh, probably in the next week or so, and we'll get that opened up. But essentially um, the way it works is it's a mentored archery deer hunt. And this is in an area that is, you can see in this picture, it is very overpopulated with deer, uh, both bucks and does. And so they need to reduce that herd in this area. And so this hunt is actually going to be inside of areas at Kickapoo that are normally not huntable um, to try to, again, reduce that population a little bit. So keep on the lookout for that. Um, and we are able to act as a mentor. So if you do get selected for a hunt and you don't have somebody, you know, eligible to mentor you or, or somebody who can take you, um, if you get selected, you can certainly reach out to us and one of us can uh, be, be sure to either connect you with the mentor or spend a day or two out there out there with you. But keep an eye out for that. Yeah, that's an awesome opportunity and one that's definitely worth the drive, especially. Yes. If, yeah, if you if you just want an opportunity at a deer, you're you're you've got a really good shot out there. <laughs> I've sat with two hunters, three three sets, two hunters, and two arrows flew. So <laughs> there's a lot of deer out there. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Oh. 
All right, and continue to play the weather. It, it becomes even more important as uh, the deer's fat reserves, be, be, uh, they're being taxed by the conditions, right? It's late in the winter, food sources are depleted. This is the lowest time of food availability of the whole year. It goes down and down as we get later into winter, and yet the conditions are potentially uh, rougher and rougher for these animals. So definitely play the weather, look for changes in the pattern. Um, also look for those cold fronts after some warm days that might make it hard for the deer to move around much during the day, get a cold front. Now all of a sudden they're moving around a lot more. Uh, you can also watch for those nights that make it really hard for the deer to move around, especially no moon, you know, really cloudy, rainy, snowy, windy, um, all night and then stop and nice the day following. Uh, there might be a lot of moving, a lot of deer feeding that day because the, the whole last night they might have been, you know, bedded up in a cedar thicket or something trying to ride that storm out. So definitely watch for that. And snow events. This is one cool thing that um, we, we don't get during hunting season every year, but if we do get snow, it, it kind of I mean, it makes it super awesome to go out there because there's no secrets after a snow. You get to see every track, you get to see uh, basically three-dimensional shorthand of every animal that, that crossed through there the night before, which normally we're oblivious to. So I love to go out in the snow. You can learn so much about animals, just find a track and follow it. And uh, I've actually had it happen before where you're out during a snowstorm and you find tracks that are fresh right? Because it's snowing, because so they would be filled in. And uh, you can then kind of switch to a spot and stalk style hunt, even in the Midwest, as long as the, the track stays in the property you have access to hunt. But you can follow that deer and eventually get close enough to maybe get, give yourself a shot opportunity. So just something cool and unique that is only going to happen at certain times a year, but not something to sleep on because it's a uh, it's those type of experiences that yield a hunt that that's memorable. You remember for all your life. And I would argue maybe sitting up in a tree stand and shooting a nice buck, certainly that's memorable. But if you stalk up in the snow on a doe on foot and get one with your bow, that might be just as memorable for you as shooting that big buck from a tree. I, I know it would be for me because I, I like that kind of hunting, but Anyway, something fun to check out for sure. Yeah, and it almost feel, I feel like these days I'm almost like a kid on Christmas Eve when when I know I get to hunt in the snow the next day. There's just something I don't I don't know. Almost the the what if, if you've never spent time in the woods when it's actively snowing, it is sincerely one of the most peaceful, quiet, relaxing places you can literally sit, and it is just Great. one of my favorite times to be yeah. out in the woods. Yeah. It's awesome. Beautiful too. Just yes. like snows like collecting on the trees and on the ground. Yeah. And the deer look gorgeous and it's easy to spot deer too. You can see them from a long ways off. Mm -hmm. And animals, they're, they're uh, you know, they're concerned. Their focus is on the snow a lot more too. So I notice you see a lot more animals you see and their wits are a little bit down because they're more focused on just what do they have to do to to survive this storm. So I uh, get to see some cool stuff. Definitely yeah. worth going out. Even if you're not hunting, just go out and find some tracks and follow it, uh, whether it's deer or any other animal, and you're going to learn a whole lot about that critter. Um, yeah, and heck, if you've already filled your deer tags, grab a shotgun and go chase some squirrels. Squirrel hunting in the snow is a blast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to add into that, I mean, yeah, it's just extraordinarily quiet with the way that the, the snow kind of uh, dampens the sound of the woods and then hearing things walk around out there at that point is really easy and then uh, seeing movement is easy with the snow on the ground and then uh, tracking blood trails in the snow is <laughs> yeah, that's quite easy compared, too. compared yeah. to compared to colored <laughs> leaves oh my goodness it's insane there's so much red out there yeah yeah it's like so, a cheat, uh, cheat code you know like yeah. if you've ever yeah. been frustrated by a blood trail just go when it snows because even if the oh man the blood stopped oh it's okay we still got, got track, track. <laughs> yep the blood's back and like <laughs> there's no secrets when that's what i love the snow yeah it's, yeah, it's great. great it's awesome 
But yeah, so this slide, the evenings are the king this time of year. And this, this really has to do with a lot of times the evenings are the nicest time of the day. Uh, deer are already naturally crepuscular. And in the winter time, um, or you know, late fall getting into winter, a lot of times in the evening, the wind calms down and uh, the sun is still a little bit out. So it's still a little bit warm and it's just a really pleasant time to be out. So I'm sure deer, it's probably pleasant for them too. It's a good time for them to move. And um, we know they're really focusing on food. They've got to replenish those uh, fat uh, stores so they can make it through what's left of the winter. Evening time is when they're going to be heading to that food as opposed to morning when they're generally heading back to the bed. So this is uh, evening's key. So if you can pick one or the other, evening for the late season is, is generally more productive. And I'll turn it over to Jason. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot, Curtis. Um, just a reminder, uh, if you're not already following us on social media um, and uh, YouTube, please do so. Uh, a lot of our information that we, uh, we come out with and all of our postings for our events, we put up on, on, uh, on Facebook there. We also have the Illinois Learn to Hunt Connection page where you can go on there and ask questions. And we try to sit back a little bit and let our, our participants help answer questions for each other and possibly go hunting with each other and hook up that way. So that's there for everyone who's ever been in a, in a event before. You guys can go there and communicate with each other. Uh, Instagram is just, again, kind of more of our updates and uh, some interesting photos that we get throughout the year. And then YouTube is our giant catalog of our information, really, is all the webinars we did during COVID. Our current webinars all live on YouTube. You can go there and check that whenever you want. We also have how-to videos and uh, informative videos, as well as our podcast is all put up on YouTube. So YouTube right now is really the biggest wealth of knowledge that we have all, all put in one area. So the other ones are more uh, fun for updates and things going on, reminders for the seasonal lotteries and things like that, and then go to YouTube and stuff for some deep dive into some of this information that we have and want to share with you all. Uh, right now, we don't have any events posted for November um, coming up here. We do have one coming up in December. We'll be posting that. We're going to be doing a uh, trail camera workshop up in Chicago area. We're going to be um, up there at uh, Nature Center and talking about um, trail cameras that we're really excited about. So uh, keep an eye out for that. That's going to be the first weekend of December. But uh, and that, that was going to be fun. We're actually yeah. going up about oh probably three weeks or so ahead of the event, and we're going to you know go through. This is an entire. We've never been to this site before. We're essentially going to scout it. We're going to hang some trail cameras, and then you know at the event we're going to take you guys in, pull the trail cameras, review the photos, see what what happened on the photos, see what we can learn from them, what you know, maybe went right, what went wrong, how would we go about hunting this area? How would we go about continuing to scout it? So it's really kind of the, the field aspect of putting a lot of these pieces, you know, the, to the puzzle together. Absolutely, yep. Where we're going, it's gonna be preserved so we can't hunt there, but you can take that information and take it with you and utilize it wherever you're gonna be going hunting at. But uh, we're really excited about that. It's also a really beautiful nature center we're going to We've been trying to get in there since they've opened it back in 2020. And uh, so, yeah, but we'll be meeting up here soon, soon and talking about what webinars and things we'll be having coming out. Uh, so keep an eye out. And now you're part of the newsletter. You'll be getting our, our updates through that. But um, so thanks for coming out. And if you have any questions, we'll sit back and answer them for you all. Um, for anyone who's just going to be taking off, uh, have a great evening. Yeah, and good luck and safe hunting out there. Rut is yeah. here. That's send right. us photos, send us stories. We, we'd love to hear. Or send us shanks, send us back. That too. <laughs> yeah, some jerky. When's the next hunting location webinar released? Next hunting location webinar? I'm not sure what you mean by hunting location webinar. Do deer move well, less when... You, you oh. mentioned the stand placement. Probably talking about that. Oh, that's all up already. So that's everything that we've done to this point is up on YouTube. Um, and then this one will be up uh, probably tomorrow. Yeah, so if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you can just go through our videos and the deer stand placement strategy was pretty much just fairly recently uploaded. Uh, have another question here. Do deer move less when the winds are calm? Um, great question. Actually, it's, it's almost the opposite. Um, deer do move a little bit more on calmer days. And a lot of it, just, just think naturally to what a deer is using 
to try to avoid predators, right? So he's using his eyesight, his hear, his ears, his ears, as well as his nose. And the windier things get out there, everything starts moving. So he can't pick up on movement very well. The wind starts swirling. So it's hard for him to pinpoint where a smell is coming from. And there's just so much noise out there that it's also hard for them to hear. And so you actually see kind of a, a reduced movement on very, very windy days um, to the, the extent that I myself, if it's a very blustery day, I, I won't even go. Um, I also don't like to just, you know, sit up in a tree and sway back and forth in the, in the wind and, you know, get seasick up there. But also you, you do see a substantial amount of, of, you know, reduced movement on those very, very windy days. They do prefer the calmer days. Just again, it allows their eyes, their nose and their ears to work a little bit better. If you're really hard up on time and need to get out that weekend because you can't go out at all. I would suggest possibly going still hunting because wind can mm -hmm. cover your your sound as you're walking across the the ground. So if you're able to um, just go go for a walk and see uh, because deer will move and eat. They have to eat even if it's windy out or not. They'll be getting up. They might not move as far as they would on a normal day, but they'll be up. So yeah, hopefully. and either that or again, like we kind of briefly touched on getting on the leeward side. So let's say you have a slope and the wind is coming this direction, hitting this slope there might be a lot of activity on this backside of the ridge that's kind of protect, protected from that, that, you know, prominent wind direction. Um, so like Curtis said, still, or Jason said, still hunting is a great option of getting out of the wind. So finding some structure that may break up that, that wind a little bit and slow it down uh, can also still be pretty good strategies if, if you go out on windy days. So make sure you practice your bow on windy days too, because that is going to affect your bow a lot, even a crossbow a lot more than it will like let's say shooting a, a firearm so definitely keep that in mind and make sure you're practicing in the wind to know what it's going to do yeah um, another question if winds are calm will bucks still circle around behind to wind a hunter even though there is no wind yes uh, so even on calm days there still will be some residual breeze coming through and it doesn't take much to carry scent molecules but also what you'll have a lot, especially on very calm days, obviously warm air rises, right? We all know that warm air becomes a little bit less dense, it rises. So as the sun comes up, essentially it's gonna warm the surface of the earth, which, create, which creates these rising columns of, of warm air that allow it to, to kind of pull scent up. So those also almost kind of act like vacuums in the case that they're going to be pulling in scent and, and really everything in and then kind of funneling it up so even on very calm days you still have that a very slight breeze from that prominent wind direction and that will be exacerbated by these kind of rising columns of, of warm air that will still move that that scent around so they still will circle downwind um, and in fact they may even do it a little bit more consistently just because they really and they, they'll do it fast too because right the, the scent is going to be lingering there he's not getting just a little bit of scent because it's not dispersing through the wind he's getting a big chunk of it so that scent is just going to be kind of lingering there and so he's still going to search on that that downwind side for sure that's yeah that's something scent checker is nice when when the wind is almost undetectable you can uh or if you pull out a couple uh milk pod seeds throw them up and they'll never just fall straight down. There's always going to be some kind of movement. Yeah. And you, always want, you always want a little bit of wind too, because I mean, hunting there within a calm day, like you just said, like the, 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 the scent lingers there. You need a little bit of it to carry, <laughs> yeah. carry it away. I mean, and also any little movement you make, every little sound you make is just going to be amplified. So ideally I really like like five to 10. Is, mm -hmm. is perfect and obviously with five to ten kind of sustained winds you'll probably get gusts in the you know 15s or so i those those are kind of the ideal winds for me because they still pick your scent up enough carry them away um and you still get a little bit of movement concealment from the noise and also just everything moving and when it comes to public land locations we didn't really talk about like regs or finding places in this webinar we in our deer 101 we do talk about that but uh, when it comes to archery, because we're talking about archery at this time of year, because if you're talking firearms, the windows past most uh, public sites, except for maybe a, a very few, um, are not going to have any firearm permits available. You can still get archery permits, and the best way to find public sites that you can hunt is to go to the 
uh, the Go Hunt uh, website that we can throw in the chat here and you can search by species by region and find just public land sites that are uh, open to hunt. So that's the best way to find them. Make sure you read through all the site specific regs because every site's a, a little bit different, but uh, archery, there's, there's a, quite a bit more opportunity for that than firearms deer for sure. And again, if, if you're brand new and you're, you're looking for, for someone to try to take you, keep an eye out for our newsletter and our postings on Facebook about this Kickapoo Mentored Hunt. Um, like I said, I got an email from DNR today that they want to do it again. And so we'll, we'll build that, that registration form and probably get that released early next week is my guess. Uh, so be on the lookout for that because that'll be a pretty good opportunity. For sure. All of you, at least, you got the first tip. You definitely need to apply. You did, yes. It doesn't hurt to apply. Nope. Yep. Real, real time. Oh, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say completely free application. doesn't cost a dollar. I was going to say real time hunting report. My father in law just shot a 10 pointer in his backyard at 6 15 tonight. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. From it's his, a, it's from a, his couch. I, that's what I'm saying. That's one of those ones from the couch, man. Uh, He's Louise. Called it. Uh, and here we have to drive an hour. I know. People don't know how good they got it. That's true. Any other questions? I tell you what, I'm nope. getting excited. Dude, I'm excited. I'm ready for this weekend. It's going to be great. Coming uh, for you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> You've just got an antler within reach of any spot in your house there, Dan. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> My darn dog decided my coyote pelt was a chew toy. Oh no! The whole nose just. That's I a didn't notice until too late. Freaking dogs! I tell you. All right. Well, good luck hunting, I think we'll everybody. Call that a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, like we said, please reach out to us with any questions, comments. If you want to share stories, share us pictures. We're always looking for, you know, people to come on the podcast to, to tell us a, a quick hunting story. So if you have success out there and a, a story you want to share, reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. But have a good evening and Dry good luck. A mountain lion. There, there's one yeah. confirmed still running around in the world. Still west running around here. somewhere. Never know where it might turn up. So definitely if you spot one of those, we'd love to chat with you too. And check out our podcast because we... We just talked about cougars in, in Illinois in our last episode. So keep yep, that's going to be that. that podcast will be up tomorrow. So uh, look forward to that. We talk about the updates on uh, what kind of cougars are in the area and where they may be coming from and how often we may see them. Good stuff. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.